All right, it looks like we have a good number of people. So we're gonna go ahead and get started. Good morning, thank you for attending the UCLA HIV Grand Rounds. Um, my name is Damilola Jolayemi. I'm just gonna give a brief overview for those who have not been a part of the series. Um, our Grand Rounds are a monthly lecture series offered by UCLA Center for HIV Identification, Prevention and Treatment Services and the UCLA AIDS Institute. And this is delivered monthly. And we invite distinguished guests who are faculty or members of um, other um, institutions to come and speak on a broad range of subjects regarding HIV. The aims of the program are to highlight important developments in AIDS-related research, encourage collaborations between UCLA investigators and invited speakers, and interest young investigators in AIDS research. So today we have um, a great speaker here with us. Um, I'm going to introduce our moderator first, and then our moderator will go ahead and introduce our speaker. So our moderator today for this um, November Grand Rounds is Dr. Pamina Gorbach who is a behavioral epidemiologist and faculty member at the UCLA Department of Ep Epidemiology. Dr. Gorbrek is also the Global HIV Co-Director at the Center for HIV Identification and Prevention and Treatment Services, okay? So Dr. Gorbrek, go ahead and take it away and I'll introduce our speaker. Thank you for moderating today. Okay, well, thank you all. And I just have to say, I am so honored um, to be able to introduce Dr. Bookbinder. I've had the privilege of um, hearing you speak over the years. I know you've seen done plenaries at CROI and other meetings and um, always been a leader in the field of HIV prevention. So I think um, it is really fantastic for CHIPS that you're joining us today. Um, the little intro that we have for you is that you're the director of Bridge HIV, which is a grant-funded HIV prevention research unit housed at the San Francisco Department of Public Health. Um, she's also a clinical professor of medicine, epidemiology, and biostatistics at the University of California, San Francisco, where she's attending physician in the Richard Fine People's Clinic and teaches in the advanced traineeship in the clinical research program. Her HIV research focuses on vaccines, pre-exposure prophylaxis, broadly neutralizing antibodies, topical microbicides, and vaginal rings, and strategies to support um, their uptake and use with a focus on reaching Black, African-American, Lat Latinx, transgender populations. She's one of the founding members and serves on the steering committee of Getting to Zero San Francisco, an initiative that aims to el eliminate new HIV infections, HIV-associated deaths, and HIV stigma. Um, and I just have to say here in um, Los Angeles, we always look to San Francisco for ideas and models. We are in the same state. Um, so we are beholden to some of the same rules and laws, but um, certainly uh, San Francisco has always served as a leader. Um, and we're really looking forward to hearing from you today. Thanks so much for that really kind introduction. Uh, and oh, let's share my, nope. there we go, okay. So uh, I am gonna be talking about our getting to zero effort in San Francisco, successes, challenges, and future strategies. And I understand that there's a movement afoot to uh, do a similar kind of project within uh, LA, and I hope that this is helpful. So uh, in 2013, before we'd started getting to zero, we already were making progress in terms of the number of new diagnoses that had declined about 28% over seven years. And we think that's as a result of a number of policy and program programmatic changes that we made. In 2006, we did away with needing written informed consent for HIV testing. In 2010, we started to deliver ART regardless of CD4 count and scale up HIV testing. In 2011, we started a linkage and navigation program for people who had dropped out of care. In 2012, we started scaling up PrEP. And in 2013, we did a pilot project at our um, our, our county hospital, San Francisco General Hospital, um, on same day uh, antiretroviral treatment um, and wraparound services. So that's how we were doing in 2013. And we had our annual World AIDS Day Forum that that year was entitled Getting to Zero in San Francisco, How Close Are We? We had a number of different presentations about a number of different projects and research that was going on. And a very astute community member said, this is all really interesting, but are you actually working together? And what we realized was that we didn't really have an integrated way that we were working together with all of these different programmatic uh, components to uh, HIV prevention and treatment. And so five of us, uh, Jeff Sheehy, who is a community activist, Neil, Gi Neil Giuliano um, from the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, Dana Van Gorder from Project Inform, Diane Havler from UCSF and I, um, decided that we should launch this Getting to Zero effort. 
And we built, decided that we would build it on the framework of collective impact, which is where you get a commitment from groups of different sectors to a common agenda to solve a specific problem. Now, collective impact is, has five core components to it. You need to have a common agenda so that you're all moving towards the same goal, common progress measures so that you are sure that you're getting to your true outcome, mutually reinforcing activities, communications, and it's really critical to have a backbone organization to keep things moving forward. And so I'm gonna, clo I'm gonna come back at the closing to talk a little bit about collective impact because I think it's really been critical to the work that we've done. So we, um, we brought together a number of different groups. This is a freestanding organization of all volunteers with the 1.2 FTEs for the backbone support. And um, we had people from the Department of Public Health, from the HIV Community Planning Council, from community-based organizations, from the private sector, including uh, Kaiser, UCSF and other research institutions, and advocates and organizing groups. And the goal was to take us from um, uh, isolated impact to collective impact. Our mission uh, has been to get to zero new HIV infections, zero HIV deaths, and zero HIV stigma and discrimination. And this is just to show you that we actually had a very strong foundation of a number of different kinds of programs for a number of different kinds of populations for both treatment and prevention services. And what we decided we would do was we were going to build, to, to begin with, we had three pillars, we added two more. Um, each of these was a different committee that was focused on a different program. One was a citywide coordinated prep program. One was rapid ART with same day starts and treatment hubs. One was a linkage engagement and retention and care. Those are the three that I'm going to go over today. We also started a reducing stigma and an adolescent and young adult committee. And each of the committees had an annual action plan, metrics, and milestones. So I'm dividing the talk into two. Um, we've got pre-COVID and post-COVID. And uh, these are some pictures of Bay Bridges um, with uh, before and after. And part of the reason is that like this bridge with very few people on it, our testing is down in 2020. And so it's hard to interpret the reduction in new infections um, using 2020 data. So I'm gonna start by giving you up where we were up until 2019, but also because we've revamped our structure and we've had an evolution of our strategic plan. So let's start with the pre-exposure prophylaxis committee. Um, what we did in that group was decided we needed to divide into three different subgroups. One that was gonna drive supply with providers, one that was gonna drive demand with potential PrEP users, and one to measure PrEP impact. And here are some of the kinds of things that we did. We developed a common protocol and posted it on our website and used it as part of our academic detailing where we have a nurse practitioner who goes out to um, various uh, organizations and uh, clinics um, and practices to help them figure out how to implement this PrEP protocol within different workflows. We started some brand new PrEP clinics. We had PrEP navigators at major pr uh, providers. We created uh, navigation boot camps for people who were working in a variety of different settings so that they could learn how to help people navigate the system and get um, coverage for their PrEP meds. Uh, and uh, clinical work, uh, sorry, lab tests. Um, we had a youth fund for meds and transportation because sometimes youth don't want to use their parents' insurance uh, for PrEP. In terms of potential PrEP users, we developed a social media campaign, uh, several of them. We had online PrEP navigator to answer questions. We developed PrEP ambassadors uh, who went out, and these are people who were using PrEP, who went out and talked about their experience using PrEP. We had a data to prep program. I'll say that wasn't entirely successful. It was go, doing outreach to people who had STIs and asking them if they were interested in prep. And one of our members started, please prep me because at that time it was difficult to know where providers were. And so we wanted um, potential prep users to be able to connect with potential prep providers. And then to measure our impact, we wanted to triangulate data from multiple sources collate data from the funded uh, CBOs that we funded to do PrEP-related work, and we did a, an online quickie survey to measure the PrEP cascade. 
So here's how we were doing uh, in 2019 at San Francisco City Clinic for men who have sex with men. And you can see that uh, over half of men who have sex with men uh, who are attending City Clinic are on PrEP. So that's uh, pretty good. Um, and it's increased each year. The challenge is that it's lower rates in Black African Americans than it is in other, uh, in other populations. So that's something that we uh, have really been trying to focus on and increase uptake in that population. Um, and then this is a, uh, a PrEP cascade um, from our community-based organizations that have been funded. And you can see that we went from 100% of the screened group to 63% who scheduled an appointment, 55% who initiated PrEP, but only 36% who stayed on PrEP at six months. So we knew we had work to do both in terms of PrEP initiation as well as PrEP persistence. This is another series of cascades about being PrEP aware, using PrEP or being PrEP adherent based on a number of different population-based surveys. And I just wanna point out that in orange, that's transgender population, green is people who inject drugs and purple is heterosexuals. You can see that knowledge was lower in that group as well as using PrEP was substantially lower in transgender people who inject drugs and heterosexual populations as was um, being PrEP adherent. So again, those are populations that need some specific attention. And we know that lack of PrEP persistence accentuates disparity. So these are data that we, we pulled out of our primary care clinics in the safety net system. We looked at all of the people who were on PrEP and how long they stayed on PrEP. On average, it was about eight months, but you can see that we had quicker drop off in Black and Latinx uh, patients than we did in our other populations. So what are some of the programs that were started? Well, we funded uh, different community-based organizations, one to focus on Black African Americans, one to focus on youth, one to focus on the transgender community, and one to focus on uh, the Latinx community. We uh, formed a collaborative practice agreement with pharmacists at this small community pharmacy so that they could actually prescribe PrEP directly without needing a clinician's prescription. Um, we had an online navigator um, that you could ask about PrEP and get information. And we had uh, a couple of campaigns. One was PrEP Supports, and uh, it was uh, for Black African American community using people uh, from the community, as well as a Viva PrEP uh, uh, campaign for the Latinx community that actually won a national award. We also started a PrEP demonstration project um, for transgender individuals. And we've been developing and testing a whole variety of apps to do a number of different things. So this is SexPro that helps you to determine what your level of risk is and what, how much benefit you'd get from PrEP. Um, we have PrepMate, which is a way of checking in with people. It's one of the evidence-based interventions from uh, that CDC has endorsed. We have, um, an app that we're developing to look at uh, 211 prep and help people to take 211 prep because it can be quite complex. And we have a project right now with home based delivery of prep, again, through a collaborative practice agreement with an online pharmacy. But we wanted to understand what happens when people go off of PrEP and particularly what happens if they seroconvert. So we interviewed all of the people in the safety net clinics who uh, were on PrEP originally and then went on to seroconvert and asked them what happened and um, with their PrEP use. And we got a number of different uh, responses. Sometimes it was about mental health, substance use or loss of housing. It was sometimes about cost and insurance side effects, difficulty making medical appointments, and risk perception, including starting a primary relationship. Um, but what almost all of them volunteered was that if a provider had done outreach to them, they might have actually stayed on PrEP. And so one of our colleagues, Padia Saberi, has started this program called PrEP uh, OI, or PrEP Optimization Intervention, that consists of having a PrEP coordinator that both identifies people at high risk and then supports multiple providers in coordinating PrEP care and PrepRx, which is a web-based uh, PrEP management tool that helps you to figure out who needs what when and uh, allows for outreach to people who drop off, of, drop off of PrEP or are behind in getting their labs done or getting refills. So that was the PrEP committee. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the RAPID committee. 
Um, the uh, rapid pilot started at Ward 86 in 2013, and um, they basically took people from the San Francisco General Hospital testing site or the clinical lab. They had a dedicated pager for a single point of contact and had a multidisciplinary team that saw newly diagnosed people that included both clinician intake, uh, including education about ART, and then social work intake, counseling, insurance, and benefits, activ activation, and optimization. So it's really important to get people, for instance, on emergency Medi-Cal and to get uh, to do some counseling as well. We did intake labs, and then the idea was to start ART immediately unless there was a clear contraindication or the patient declined. We used ART starter packs where they could get the first dose actually in clinic at that time, and then a prescription was sent to the pharmacy, and they had very close follow-up in one to two days with a social worker or nurse, and then additional close follow-up um, with a clinician uh, in the first couple of weeks and in the first several months. So this is what happened with that rapid pilot. We went from going from CD4 guided testing, uh, CD4 guided, sorry, antiretroviral treatment to universal antiretroviral treatment, regardless of CD4 count, to rapid same day starts. And you can see that the time it takes to prescribe ART shortened as, um, as we implemented these successive programs and therefore the time to viral load suppression was reduced substantially. But we wanted to spread this out citywide, um, not just to limit it to San Francisco General Hospital. So the, the RAPID committee developed a citywide protocol, put it on our website, and used that same public health detailing approach using a nurse practitioner to go out to individual providers and train them to be able to do RAPID ART starts. We also developed a, uh, a compendium of rapid care options in San Francisco so that people could figure out where to refer people to, whether it was organizations, uh, com community-based organizations, um, clinics, uh, individual providers, and um, their point of contact at those locations and what kind of insurance they took um, or eligibility for actually getting care at those places. And here's how we've done um, from 2013 and shown in yellow to 2019 uh, shown in the, the blue gray. We went from eight days to one day in terms of diagnosis to care. We went from 27 days to zero days on average for care to ART. We went from 76 days to 40 days from ART to viral suppression. So if you go from diagnosis all the way to viral suppression, we were able to cut that from 135 days down to just 40 days. And while that was true on average, we wanted to look at the outliers. So we looked at the proportion who started ARVs within seven days by year, as well as those that started ARVs after 30 days. And so what you can see here is that each year we've had an increase in 2019, we had 63% who started uh, antiretroviral therapy within seven days, and 8%, um, only 8% now, who had taken um, more than 30 days to start antiretroviral treatment. That's citywide. And citywide, we wanted to look at disparities. So we looked at race, ethnicity, transmission category, and housing status. What you can see is in 2015, we had substantial racial and ethnic disparities that have reduced over time so that right now white individuals have the longest time to viral suppression, but it's pretty close to the other racial and ethnic groups. We've had a big decline in the disparities in terms of transmission group. It's still a little bit longer in people who inject drugs. And in terms of people who are housed versus those who are experiencing homelessness, um, we now have no gap between the two uh, populations in terms of time to viral suppression. So um, Ward 86 wanted to look at their, um, their outcomes from the RAPID program, not just how quickly they could get people on RAPID, but did they actually stay virally suppressed? And so one year after ART, 95.8% um, ever achieved a viral load of less than 200 copies. And by uh, three years after infection, 92% had a viral load of less than 200 copies at their last viral load that was recorded. And that's despite the fact that 51% of these 
this population has a major substance use disorder, 48% have a mental health, a major mental health disorder, and 31% were homeless. So people were actually able to not just start on antiretroviral treatment and get suppressed, but to stay suppressed over time. So the RAPID committee wanted to look at this diffusion of innovation and figure out how do we get the late majority and the laggards to actually offer RAPID um, ART to their patients. And so these are some of their lessons learned. They, want, they needed to enlist local champions and opinion leaders early. So that was true at Ward 86 at Kaiser and at the Department of Public Health. They did outreach and dissemination in every way possible. So they did it at the community level through public meetings, at the institutional level through grand rounds at healthcare organizations, and at the provider level using this detailing program as well as peer-to-peer -peer conversations. And then they needed to enlist allies and they looked everywhere for enlisting allies in public health and academic and community medicine, in testing organizations and community-based organizations and even with local press. So here are some common objections to RAPID during implementation um, and some of the responses that the team has. So there's always this question about patient readiness and the need for preparation, and that's often voiced by individual providers. Um, but their response is that there's a, there are qualitative studies of patient and provider experience that argue against this, that um, making vulnerable populations wait to start ART only widens disparities, and that RAPID isn't mandatory, that actually people have agency and that it gives them additional agency for disclosure and for taking care of their health to get them started on antiretroviral treatment immediately. Um, the practice transformation needed for RAPID is difficult and that was often voiced by larger clinics or healthcare organizations. And what we found is that it's easier than it seems, it, you need to start slow and having a RAPID champion is crucial to success at each organization. And then there's systems barriers like finding a culturally appropriate clinic, insurance obstacles. And the issue is that yes, these, these barriers are real. Starter packs can bridge some of the delays. Um, linkage and benefits navigation is really essential to the, to the uh, program and its ability to be implemented. And we have tools like the Rapid Provider Guide that people have found quite useful in, um, in implementing Rapid. So the third committee was re-engagement and care. And retention and re-engagement is the toughest step in the care continuum. So some of the things that they did were they expanded links, which is a linkage, integration, navigation, and comprehensive services for people living with HIV who are not in care, where we go out and actually find people who have dropped out of care and get them reconnected. We embedded retention specialists at clinics with the most vulnerable populations. We scaled up intensive case management. We created a food security and an employment services program. A frontline organizing group was formed um, that helped again with capacity building and support at a variety of different organizations to have frontline workers um, all joined together. We created cell phone charging stations at a number of CBOs. And part of that was because it's very difficult as a provider to get in touch with your patient if they can't charge their cell phone. Um, so they, um, there was a big request for cell phone charging stations. But it's also clear that we need to address housing, mental health, and substance use treatment in order to get to zero. And so this is the care cascade in 2019. The blue bars are people who were San Francisco cases, meaning they were diagnosed when they were living in San Francisco. And the purple bars are people who are San Francisco cases who were last known to reside in San Francisco in 2019. And you can see that we had 75% um, viral suppression uh, among all of our uh, people living with HIV in San Francisco um, who were still in San Francisco. And that compares with 56% nationally. But we didn't achieve that 75% for everyone. So we wanted to see who were we missing. And we uh, had slightly lower rates in cisgender women in black and Latinx uh, populations in the 30 to 49 year olds, in people who inject drugs, whether they were also MSM or transgender women um, who have sex with men uh, who also inject drugs. People who are homeless were the ones that uh, had substantially lower rates than all the other groups and people who are non-US born. So let's focus in on people who are experiencing homelessness. Um, 
one of the fellows at the time uh, at Ward 86 did this analysis looking at a spectrum of uh, being uh, unstably housed, going from renting or owning to being in a treatment center or transitional housing, an SRO hotel, couch surfing, living in a shelter or living outdoors. And what you can see is as you go down this spectrum, your, the proportion who are virally suppressed declines and the viral load actually increases substantially. And if you look at um, people who are stably housed, who are temporarily housed and who are homeless, you can see that the urgent care visits were also higher if you were temporarily housed or homeless as were emergency room visits, as were hospitalizations. So homelessness really does affect uh, the uh, care that you get or the, the care that you need. Um, we also know that there's this intersectionality. So in 2019, African-Americans made up only 5.6% of the San Francisco population, but they made up 17% of newly diagnosed individuals and fully 25%, a quarter of people who were li are homeless who were living with HIV. So um, that's a pretty stark reminder that we've got this intersectionality challenge that um, is, uh, is one that we need to address. And contribution to deaths among people living with HIV, we did this death certificate analysis and medical chart review on 50 people who had died in 2016 and 2017, and looked at what were some direct causes of death. 60% had substance use as a direct cause, 34% was mental illness, 30% was homelessness, and more than two thirds had any of these three. So it's really clear that we need to address substance use, mental illness, and homelessness if we're gonna to get to zero uh, preventable deaths. So how did the Lynx program do? Um, well, the Lynx program, again, takes people who have dropped out of care and tries to reconnect them with care. And what you can see is the blue bars are the overall viral suppression rates. The red bars are the viral suppression rates for people enrolled in the Lynx program in 2019. And what you can see is that we did almost as well, or in the case of the Latinx uh, community, did a little bit better in um, viral suppression in people who were in the Lynx program compared with those who weren't. And if you look at uh, uh, people experiencing homelessness, 39% in the general population were um, virally suppressed, whereas we were able to get that up to 62% in the Lynx program. So we want to get to zero, but we know that we can't do it without housing. So we formed a homelessness task force in 2018. We created a getting to zero call to action in the spring of 2018 to try to influence the city's housing program to include medical vulnerability and prioritization. We supported Prop C, which ultimately um, passed. It was called Our City, Our Home Coalition, where um, they tax the city's wealthiest companies to provide homeless resources. We um, in, implemented some clinical innovation. The group at Ward 86 created a pop-up clinic that I'll describe in a little bit. And then there's Opt-in, which is a citywide effort to deliver integrated HIV, STI, and Hep C services to people who are unstably housed. So here we are, 2019, um, how well did we do? We, um, from 2013, when we started getting to zero, to 2019, we had a 59% decline in new diagnoses. And if you look in the US from 2015 to 2019, there were 8%, there was an 8% decline. In that period of time, we had a 43% decline. So we feel like these programs really have been driving down new infections. And then COVID hit. Um, and we went into shelter in place uh, for all residents in March of uh, 2020. And um, we were in shelter in place for, for several months. And so what you can see is this is what happened to HIV testing rates. This was at medical facilities and the red bar outlines the people who were in the show. This was the period of time of shelter in place. So you can see we had a really dramatic decline then and then we rebounded to pre-pandemic levels by March of 2021. But if you look at the testing being done in community-based organizations, we had an even more uh, profound drop in, uh, in HIV testing, and we have not yet rebounded to pre-pandemic levels. 
The same was true for chlamydia and syphilis testing. Those also dropped off um, and have rebounded, but not quite to pre-pandemic levels. So here's where we are in 2020. The green line now shows you um, the new diagnoses. So we're at 131 di new diagnoses in 2020. That was a 22% drop from the year before. The year before that, we had an 18% drop, and the year before that, we had a 14% drop. So we think that this more accelerated drop is partly because we may be missing people who have become infected but didn't get tested. At least that's one hypothesis. Another hypothesis is that people were having less sex, but we know that that changed over time. So we have concerns about missing people who may be infected, um, and we're unaware. This is the death rate uh, from all causes shown in the purple line. And you can see that it's been very stable over time, but HIV related causes continue to decline. So it was just under half in 2008 to 2011, and it went to under a third by 2016 to 2019. So we are driving down HIV specific uh, deaths, but we still have other preventable deaths that we need to work on. And then the yellow bars show people living with HIV, um, we have almost 16,000 San Francisco residents at uh, who are living with HIV, and 70% uh, of them are 50 years of age or older. So we have an aging population living with HIV that we also need to address. So these are the annual rates of HIV diagnosis by gender and race ethnicity. And what you can see is that um, it's, we have these disparities. This is adjusted for the size of the population. The incidence rate is highest in black men, then followed by Latino men, followed by black women who have even higher rates than white men and Asian Pacific Islander men in San Francisco. So we have these racial and ethnic disparities in terms of number of new diagnoses that need to be addressed. And if we look at mortality rates, again, age, uh, age adjusted for, per 100,000 population, this is transgender women. And then in blue are black African-American men um, that they have a higher rate of death um, compared with um, uh, uh, in people living with HIV compared with uh, Asian, I'm sorry, with Latinx and white men who have sex with men. And black women also have higher rates than Latinx and white women. Um, so we have these disparities in terms of survival as well. This is what happened to viral load testing. We had a similar decline with a rebound to near pre-pandemic levels. So here's how we've been doing in terms of our um, viral suppression. So being linked to care if you're newly diagnosed within one month of diagnosis was 92% in 2020. In 2019, it was 95%. So maybe a little bit of a drop. And then um, viral suppression within six months um, went from 80% to 77%. So again, it's hard to say whether that's a, a true drop or not, but um, something that we need to watch for. We are overall, for all people living with HIV, the rates of viral suppression were 70% in 2020 compared to 75% in 2019. The red bars are the viral suppression rates in uh, 2020 and the blue bars are 2019. So what you can see is it's the same exact populations where we're doing less well in terms of um, viral suppression and we're doing worse than we did in 2019 in all of these cases in cis women, in black and Latinx individuals, in 30 to 49 year olds, in people who inject drugs and in the non-US born. And where we're doing really, really, really poorly is in people experiencing homelessness. So this on the left shows people who are experiencing homelessness, people who are housed on the right, and this is 2019 and 2020. And what you can see is that we went from 56% of uh, people living with HIV who received care in 2019 down to 33%. And in terms of viral suppression, it was only 20%. We went from 39 to 20%. Um, so really plummeting um, rates of viral suppression in people experiencing homelessness. And if we look at viral suppression among people who received care, that was still only 61% compared to 92% in people who are housed. So with that in mind, um, we felt that getting to zero is catalyzed progress in reducing HIV infections and improving the lives of those with HIV, but we've not yet reached our target goals. And so we needed a new strategic plan. 
We um, have new challenges such as COVID, but we also have new opportunities such as long acting agents. Um, our member organizations and community groups have evolved over the last five years as well. So we need to pivot to a structure that responds to the current landscape, incorporates a diverse leadership and members that include both community and technical representation. We need new ways of uh, engaging with community organizations. We need to optimize approaches for communication and all of our work has to center on racial equity and justice. So these are our new committees. We have the PREP and PEP committee led by Al Lu and Nicole Trainer, the RAPID 2.0 committee led by Susa Coffey and Miguel Ibarra, the People Experiencing Homelessness committee, which is a new committee led by Liz Imbert and Mickey Matani, and another new committee, um, Aging MSM Living with HIV and Private Sector Engagement led by Brad Hare and Ramon Matos. And then we have some areas of advocacy. So an HIV and COVID group led by Brad Hare and Janessa Broussard, adolescents and young adults led by Tonya Chaffee and Adam Leonard, and accidental drug overdose prevention um, by Mary Lawrence Hicks and Paul Harkin. So I'm gonna tell you about three of the groups briefly, the COVID and HIV group, the PrEP group, and the um, people experiencing homelessness group. So, um, the COVID group wanted to monitor the impact of COVID on treatment and prevention, disseminate COVID information to the HIV impacted community and um, identify support and amplify best practices for service provision during COVID. And so here are some of the things that that group has done. Um, they created a town hall on COVID-19 and living with HIV. They created a guidance for people living with HIV during the COVID surge um, and update this regularly and have it posted on our website. And then we created a mini uh, consortium meeting on HIV and COVID fact checking in San Francisco's vaccination plan. We also did some community engagement in the era of COVID. So um, one that was about safer sex in the time of Corona and one for the transgender community. And we created guidance on safer sex and COVID-19, reducing stigma through harm reduction. And so this was done really early in the epidemic when people didn't know what to do in terms of having sex and being exposed to COVID. And so this just helped people to decide what were lower risk and higher risk activities. And we got the city to declare that prevention and care of HIV, Hep C and STIs are essential services because a lot of things were limited early on to essential services. And that was true for HIV prevention, HIV treatment, Hep C and sexual health and sexually transmitted infections. We also uh, signed up for the takemehome.org um, program that allows for home HIV and STI testing, which gets around needing to go to community-based organizations or clinical facilities to get tested. Let's turn to talking about PrEP next. Um, this is how we were doing in terms of PrEP in uh, at Kaiser. And you can see that we were doing really well and then had this big drop off with a rebound now. And similarly at San Francisco City Clinic, our municipal STD clinic, we had a drop off and then a rebound. City Clinic was able to continue to increase the proportion of men who have sex with men on PrEP um, because they prioritized uh, PrEP patients for visits even during the lockdown period. Um, but again, even though we're improving year after year in all of the racial and ethnic groups, Black African Americans are still lagging behind uh, all the other racial and ethnic groups. So the PREP committee goals, um, this is just four, they have like eight of them, um, but they wanted to do systematic monitoring of PREP use, including creating these PREP equity targets to be sure that we're actually reaching all of the populations we need to reach. Um, equitable implementation of long acting cabotegravir by creating a core protocol and working with the different groups that are gonna implement Cab LA once it becomes uh, available. They wanna increase PrEP uptake among cisgender women at risk for HIV, people who inject drugs and people experiencing homelessness. And then they wanna coordinate strategies to minimize the impact of COVID on PrEP at these major PrEP providers. Then finally, I'm gonna tell you about the people experiencing homelessness group. So this was a study that was done at Ward 86, looking at what are the 
important clinic attributes um, in, uh, for people who were unstably housed. And what they said was what was most important were drop-in visits and having patient-centered care. That's what came out. It was less important how close you were to the, um, to the clinic, having financial incentives and being able to call your provider directly instead of going through a uh, front desk. And so they formed the pop-up clinic based on, um, on some of this, these data where the eligibility criteria are that you need to be homeless or unstably housed, be virally unsuppressed or report being off of ART, or having difficulty engaging in primary care with at least one missed primary care visit or at least two unscheduled drop-in visits. And here's what they did is they've opened up the clinic every afternoon for drop-in access and people get comprehensive primary care with relationship-centered care there's enhanced outreach to people who um, are in the pop-up program and they get some incentives for getting their care. And I'm just gonna show you a couple of highlights from this slide. This is, um, they had offered pop-up to 166 patients, but only 60% enrolled. 12% have already died. So this is a quite a vulnerable population. 18% discontinued for one reason or another and 70 are still continuing. This is a very vulnerable population with 53% living on the street and 85% using meth. So this is really reaching a very vulnerable population. And yet at six and 12 months, they've been able to get to 51% um, viral suppression. So um, they are making headway with, uh, with this population. And one of the unexpected um, consequences of getting these hotels for shelter in place for during shelter in place for people experiencing homelessness was we housed people in um, in hotels in these SIP hotels, and zero to nine months after SIP, and then six to nine months after SIP, they saw a dramatic decline in the number of ED visits that were required, and they saw more engagement in care. And this is a quote in. Um, in provider care. This is a quote from one of the people, one of the guests who was housed. He said, I had the chance to get things straight and organize, keep appointments. It's hard to keep appointments and be on time and do things when you're homeless, which is clearly the case. And so getting people housed is really critical to getting to zero. So the people experiencing homelessness committee goals are to identify current gaps in care by going through DPH epidemiology data and inventorying programs and services, looking for pressure points, developing countermeasures, um, and creating an advisory group of people with lived experience. We're, we are not an island in San Francisco, but we are a peninsula, and we do have a lot of people who work, play, and, uh, and travel throughout the Bay Area. Um, and so uh, what we needed to do was also look at what's going on in Alameda County, where over the last several years, we haven't seen a really dramatic decline in the number of new diagnoses. And Santa Clara County, where again, um, it's been pretty level in terms of the number of new diagnoses. So we're trying to build region-wide approaches to our work. And we're trying to find new ways of engaging with communities. So this is just an example, um, Unidos en Salud, uh, United in Health that Diane Havler's group started. Okay, this is our mayor, London Breed. They went out into the community, into the Latinx community in the Mission District and started doing COVID testing, COVID linkage to, to services, to linkage to COVID services, and then ultimately COVID vaccinations. Um, and that's been really quite a successful model. And then we try to share best practices. So these are some of the states and some of the countries where we have been asked to do some capacity building. Um, and people, uh, in addition to this, also download materials from our website, which is just getting to zero sf.org. So I wanted to close just by talking about collective impact and why collective impact. The complex nature of most social programs belies the idea that any single program or organization, however well managed and funded, can single-handedly create lasting large-scale large change. And so there was an actual assessment of does collective impact really make an impact? And they evaluated 25 US initiatives using something called process tracing. What they found was that there was an impact in some but not all projects. And they 
synthesized their major lessons to five. There was a diversity in approaches that worked, so not one, all, one size doesn't fit all. The quality of the implementation matters, so backbone support and a common agenda is most important. An equity lens must be systematically applied to make a difference. It takes time to create real change, four to seven years for successful projects, and that there's lots more to learn about collective impact. And so the collective impact principles of practice are that you design and implement the initiative with a priority placed on equity, that you need to include community members in the collaborative, you need to use data to continuously learn, adapt, and improve, you need to build a culture that fosters relationships, trust, and respect across participants. And you need to customize for local context. And so um, in conclusion, collective impact has been a fruitful mechanism for working together in San Francisco. Great progress is being made, but disparities remain. So we have to dig deeper into addressing poor outcomes for Black African Americans, Latinx, and people experiencing homelessness. We need more programs for people who inject drugs, including safe injection sites. And we need to address the needs of trans and cis women um, who have been understudied in San Francisco. We need to integrate interventions for HIV with STI and hep C prevention and treatment. We need Bay Area wide efforts. And our next stage of programs has to focus on homelessness, substance use, and mental health. And with that, this is our steering committee. Um, without whom the work would not be done. And I just want to point out in particular, Courtney Levy, who's our coordinator, who just does an amazing job of keeping us all moving forward um, and all of the committees on track to, to achieve their goals. And then many thanks to our over 300 members for all of their support, their, their work and our sponsors for their financial support. Some additional thanks to people who loan slides and um, I want to thank our mayor and our late mayor, uh, Ed Lee, who really helped us launch Getting to Zero, our director of public health, Dr. Grant Colfax, our San Francisco Board of Supervisors, and the HIV Planning Council. And with that, I'll stop sharing the screen, and I'm happy to take questions. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. That was a tour de force, really incredible and impressive program and what's going and really powerful to sort of see data and actual numbers on the impact of COVID through all this. Um, I don't think personally I've seen that um, before so well documented um, regarding HIV. So we have about 10 questions here. Um, and I think we're going to try something a little different if Dami's able to do this with me. Um, and, you know, rather than sort of Dami and I selecting the questions and giving them to you, I think we'd like to share the screen and have you take a look at the questions and, um, you know, jump on the ones that seem to you um, sort of the most poignant. Um, there are some really interesting questions about organizational structure, as well as questions about, Dami, I think we can share the screen, so we're all good. Okay, yeah, it's now um, bolded. Um, as well as specific questions about certain populations, like Black women, um, uh, and questions about retention. So let's take a minute and let you absorb, and then um, jump through. Okay. Um... Let me just start with, in the collective impact structure, um, they talk about a backbone organization. Our backbone organization is largely um, volunteer. We have 1.2 FTEs for our, our getting to zero coordinator, uh, Courtney Levy, and then 0.2 um, of Mary Lawrence Hicks, who works closely with Courtney um, to help manage, which is just a tremendous amount of work to get keep you know, to convene all of these various committees and get them working, moving forward. Um, so all of that, the rest of the work that we do is volunteer, but the, the steering committee really, we meet on a monthly basis and we have strategic planning that's done. We have three um, scheduled uh, major consortium meetings each year. And last year, because of COVID, we decided to start doing some mini um, co consortium meetings. And so that was helpful in terms of communication. But in terms of backbone, it really is pretty bare bones. It's 1.2 FDEs is, is the only funded positions that we have, but then we have a very strong steering committee. Um, somebody asked about um, collaborative practice agreements. That's um, something that you can do with, at least within California, where you form a collaborative practice agreement with a pharmacist. Um, or a pharmacy group. 
in which you are providing backup for them, but they can actually then do the prescriptions for PrEP. And it's been, uh, it's been approved and it's worked really well for us. Um, so it allows the pharmacy to do direct um, PrEP, uh, you know, PrEP provision. And given that PrEP is such a, an easy thing to administer um, and doesn't really require a lot of uh, algorithms or anything like that, it really works quite well and the pharmacist can operate very independently. Um, How about this one about the stakeholders? I think that's an interesting question. Um, how uh, you have um, engagement, um, how you would characterize that from non-professional HIV stakeholders. Let's see, how would you characterize balance of convening Six. stakeholders to channel the work in a synchronous and synergistic way against the collaborative taking on actual projects? So what we um, have done is really tried to reach into um, our HIV planning council and some of the major community-based organizations make sure that they have some representation on our steering committee. And then the work of the steering committee is really to help support and guide the committee, the, the committees themselves and the, the work that they do. Um, and we ask everybody and, and to create funding um, streams as we need it. So we've gone to bat with the city to get funding for um, needs that the, com the committees have identified. And we also have helped the committees to apply for foundation and industry level grants um, for, uh, to fund specific projects that they develop. We ask everybody who works on the steering committee to leave their uh, particular affiliation at the door and their specific um, agenda for their organization at the door and to really work um, collaboratively on, uh, on the, the strategic planning for the entire organization. And that's worked really well. I will say early on, we had challenges um, on the steering committee with tussles a little bit about who was controlling what, but I think once we became clear about what the goals of the steering committee were, and that it really is to support the work of the committee structures themselves, um, and we got a, a more diverse uh, steering committee structure, I think that, that a lot of that fell away. So I'm not sure if that answers the, the question about uh, stakeholders. Um, All right. The one about um, how you got the city to declare HIV STI services is essential is also sort of interesting. Yeah, that was um, pretty easy. We, um, you know, I think that the city itself is uh, very committed to HIV and STI prevention and treatment. Um, and they didn't realize the negative impact they had when they decided that um, only essential work could be done during uh, the shelter in place. And so once we said, you know, we're having, we looked at the data and said, look at what's happened to HIV testing. Look at what's happened to viral load testing. Um, people are just not getting the prevention or care services that they need. And people are not getting PrEP and they're not getting treatment. Um, they were, they, they understood that immediately. And, you know, I think it helps that we've got, I'm part of the health department. Um, we've got several members of the health department on the steering committee. Um, and so we use those channels as well um, to, uh, to try to, uh, uh, you know, uh, help facilitate change where it's needed in the health department. Um, and so that, that was just an easy one. Um, they said, of course, it's essential services. We didn't, we didn't make that explicit, but it, it will make it explicit. Um, so oh. I think, yeah, go ahead. Number nine, let's just hit that as the last one. Other places where HIV rates in black women exceed those in white men? I would assume that, you know, it, it's surprising for us because so such a small proportion of our um, number of infections are in women. So it's not the absolute number that are greater, but it's the rate per hundred population. I think that that's probably true in much of the um, Southeast um, would be my guess that um, where there's a really more intense epidemic in black women, um, that the case rate per 100,000 population may be higher than what we see in white men, but I, I don't know that for a fact. Time for one more. So any one, last question, you should pick your favorite. Okay. Um, 
I think uh, I'm just looking at the last one um, that could giving everyone a drop in option with reminders rather than relying on an appointment system make a difference. I think it probably would. I mean, we ask people to adhere to our needs rather than to adhere to their needs. I think what's challenging is that that can be very difficult to implement on a system wide basis. So trying to implement that at least by setting aside a group of providers who can handle the 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 ebbs and flows of people dropping in. And rather than what, what was happening before was people would drop in and they would get their urgent care um, need taken care of, but they weren't getting comprehensive services. They weren't getting back onto their antiretrovirals necessarily. They weren't getting the other linked to the other social services that they required. And so being able to do that in a comprehensive way um, is, has been really transformational, I think, for, um, for this population, um, but I think it's hard to implement uh, system-wide. It would be great if, if it can be implemented system-wide, that would be a great thing. Okay. Um, if in a couple seconds you could say something about the number five MCC questions, and then we really have to can close it Can you tell me up. what MCC is? Is that the... Um, the retention achieved beyond the, is that the LINCS program? Oh, think so. maybe that's the... I think I'm that's our LA specific program. Oh. That is our medical care coordination. Ah, okay. Um, so that may be like our, um, I don't know what the, how the MCC program has done in terms of retention. Um, you know, we do have uh, some drop off in our uh, in pop up clinic, as I showed you, we had people who died, people who moved away, and some people who declined continuing care, although that was a fairly small minority of people. Um, and in the links program, we do we, the problem with our links program is that it's been time limited so that we were getting people linked to care within three months, but then dropping off uh, our ongoing commit uh, services with them. That's why we decided we needed a, um, an enhanced. Um, case management program for an intensive case management for those people who require intensive case management. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, I think that is it. And I apologize if there were some questions that folks wanted answered that we didn't get a chance to. We'll try to follow up with those post lecture. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for attending. This was a really big group, a very impressive turnout. Um, and we really want to thank you, um, Dr. Bookbinder, for um, sharing all this with us and so that we could learn about the program up there in San Francisco. Um, and we appreciate the collaboration from um, our UCLA AIDS Institute up at UCSF um, and allowing you or supporting you to do so. That's part of this. Um, the recording of this presentation, this has been recorded. The slides will be posted on the CHIPS website website and all that information about that will be emailed. Um, so I want to just thank everyone for participating and Dr. Bookbinder again. And um, the, we um, really appreciate that and we've learned a lot from you. It's been a tremendous success. San Francisco always um, leads the way and impresses us and we have a lot to learn um, from you. So thanks for sharing with well, us. Well, we always have a lot to learn from other jurisdictions as well. So we hope you'll stay in touch and um, share some of your best practices with us as well. And we're happy to share any of our best practices with you. Great. And yes, uh, just to confirm, this will be posted for anyone who's asking on the CHIPS website. It is recorded. So thank you very much. Thanks.